A well, very good morning to you on this Wednesday, the 14th of July, and welcome to our morning prayer at St. Peter's Church, Ipsley. Wherever you are in the world, you are most welcome. We pray an opening prayer. Let us pray. To our God, a beginning and end, accompany us in this day's journey. Dawn on our darkness, open our eyes to praise you for your creation and to see the work you set before us today. Take us and use us to bring to others the new life you give through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today in the church's calendar, we remember John Cable. John Cable was born in 1792 at Fairford, near Bristol. A churchman and a poet who wrote lengthy poems to be read at holy days and feast days. He also wrote a memorable hymn, New Every Morning is the Love, Our Waking and Uprising Proved. Keble College in Oxford is named after him. And here is just one verse of the poem he composed for Easter Saturday. Prisoner of hope thou art, look up and sing of promised spring, as in the pith his father's darling lay, beside the desert way, and knew not how his God would save from that living grave. So buried with our Lord, we'll close our eyes to the decaying world till angels bid us rise. A psalm for us today is Psalm 119. I'm not going to read all of it, we're just going to read from verse 153. That's Psalm 119, reading from verse 153. Look on my suffering and deliver me, for I have not forgotten your law. Defend my cause and redeem me. Preserve my life according to your promise. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek out your decrees. Your compassion, Lord, is great. Preserve my life according to your laws. Many are the foes who persecute me but I've not turned from your statutes. I look on your faithless, look on the faithless with loathing, for they do not obey your word. See how I love your precepts. Preserve my life, Lord, in accordance with your love. All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. Rulers persecute me without cause but my heart trembles at your word. I rejoice in your promise, like one who finds great spoil. I hate and detest falsehood, but I love your law. Seven times a day I praise you for your righteous laws. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. I wait for your salvation, Lord, and I follow your commands. I obey your statutes, for I love them greatly. I obey your precepts and your statutes, for all my ways are known to you. May my cry become, may my cry come before you, Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. May my supplication come before you. Deliver me according to your promise. May my lips overflow with praise, for you teach me your decrees. May my tongue sing of your word, for all your commands are righteous. May your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, Lord, and your law gives me delight. Let me live that I may praise you, and may your laws sustain me. 
I have strayed like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I have not forgotten your commands. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. In these closing verses of the longest psalm, we read that the author is suffering from unjust persecution. However, he still praises God seven times a day for his righteous laws or commandments. He obeys God's commandments and precepts to the point of actually loving them. Then from verse 169 onwards, he pours out his heart in praise. He yearns to live in continuous praise, praying for God to sustain him. Then from verse 176, he acknowledges his straying from God, possibly through sin. But he's not forgotten God's commandments. Our praise and thanks should be 24-7, or at least in our waking hours, recognising God's laws and his plans for us. Continuing in the book of Ezekiel for our Old Testament reading, we're reading from Ezekiel chapter 12, verses 1 to 16. That's Ezekiel chapter 12, verses 1 to 16. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, son of man, you are living among a rebellious people. They have eyes to see, but do not see, and ears to hear, but do not hear, for they are a rebellious people. Therefore, son of man, pack your belongings for exile, and in the daytime, as they watch, set out and go from where you are to another place. Thus they will understand that they are a rebellious people. During the daytime, while they watch, bring out your belongings, pack for exile. Then in the evening, while they are watching, go out like those who go into exile. While they watch, dig through the wall and take your belongings out through it. Put them on your shoulder as they are watching and carry them out at dusk. Cover your face so that you cannot see the land for I have made you a sign to the Israelites. So I did this as I was commanded. During the day I brought out my things packed for the exile. Then in the evening I dug through the wall with my hands. I took my belongings out at dusk, carrying them on my shoulders while they watched. In the morning the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, did not the Israelites, that rebellious people, ask you, what are you doing? Say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. This prophecy concerns the Prince in Jerusalem and all the Israelites who are there. Say to them, I am a sign to you. As I have done, so it will be done to them. They will go into exile as captives. The Prince among them will put his things on his shoulder at dusk and leaving the hole will be dug in the wall for him to go through. He will cover his face so that he cannot see the land. I will spread my net for him, and he will be caught in my snare. I will bring him to Babylonia, the land of the Chaldeans, but he will not see it, and there he will die. I will scatter to the winds all those around him, his staff and all his troops, and I will pursue them with drawn sword. They will know that I am the Lord when I disperse them among the nations and scatter them through the countries. But I will spare a few of them from the sword, famine and plague, so that in the nations where they go, they have acknowledge all their detestable practices. Then they will know that I am the Lord. 
And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In this chapter, God's calling Ezekiel to act out a somewhat bizarre scene, which would hopefully make the Israelites who were left in Jerusalem take notice of their impending fate of being carried off by the Babylonians. Verse 2 tells us that we are a rebellious people with eyes that do not see and ears that do not hear the Lord's commands. These actions of carrying a bag of essentials for survival and breaking through a wall and the covering of his face were to be a dramatic warning to those remaining in Jerusalem. In verse 12, Ezekiel never referred to Zedekiah as king, but called him the prince in Jerusalem. The real king, Joachim, was captive in Babylon. Zedekiah would try to escape, but would be ensnared by net and carried off to Babylonia. We pray that our eyes and ears will always be alert to God's word to us, preventing us being carried off into the captivity of darkness. Amen. Continuing the second book of Paul's to the Corinthians, chapter eight, verses one to 15. Of 2 Corinthians, chapter eight, Verses 1 to 15. The collection for the Lord's people. And now, brothers and sisters, we want to, to know about the grace that God has given to the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people, and they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urge Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we've kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want you to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first, not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work, so that your willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard pressed, but that there might be a quality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need. So that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality, as it is written. The one who gathered much did not have too much. And the one who gathered little did not have too little. And this is the word of the Lord. The 
churches of Macedonia referred to at the beginning of this passage were those of Philippi, Thessalonica and Berea. Paul considers both the opportunity and the willingness to give, to be a gift from the grace of God. Paul is raising money to help the poor Christians in Jerusalem, using the example of the Macedonian church who gave according to their ability and also gave willingly first to the Lord. Verse 15, Paul quotes from Exodus chapter 16, verse 18, referring to the manna from heaven. The one who gathered much did not have too much. And the one who gathered little did not have too little. Just as manna was hoarded by some out of greed, which then rotted, so if we store up riches for ourselves at the expense of the church and the poor, we will perish along with their owners. How frequently do we review our giving to the Lord's work? Most of us now give to the church through the parish giving scheme, which can automatically increase our giving each year by the cost of living index. If you haven't signed up, please contact Pam Butler, who will be only too willing to help you. Also, the more people who do sign up to the parish giving scheme, it lessens the workload on our treasurer. Let us now turn to the Lord in prayer. And the response is a bidding, Lord, hear us. Please, Lord, graciously hear us. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Heavenly Father, strengthen your church where she is weak. Bring harmony where there is division. Give wisdom to our archbishops, Justin and Stephen, our diocesan bishops, John and Martin, together with their advisors, so that we will be led into deeper spirituality to seek the right way forward when restrictions are lifted. Lord, continue God's healing of his life and bless all the ministry of our clergy, LLMs, and worship leaders at St. Peter's, Christ Church, and St. John's. From the Diocese of Prayer Diary, we are asked to pray for the Episcopal Church of the Philippines, as it brings comfort and relief to those recovering from so many hurricanes and floods. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Heavenly Father, give thanks and praise for the 10th anniversary of the nation of South Sudan. Bless and protect all Christians in that young nation, so they may be protected from North Sudan with its aggressive Muslim population. Pray for many countries around the world caught up in violence and terrorist activity. Pray for the Yemen, the Tigray area of Ethiopia, for Nigeria and for many other countries which don't make the news headlines. Lord, grant peace to these lands and change the hearts and minds of those in authority so that their people can live in peace and harmony with one another. Heavenly Father, give wisdom and courage to our Prime Minister who together with the government will soon be making positive decisions to ease restrictions. May people not jump the gun by discarding masks and joining in with parties, which could cause a spike in infections, placing a burden on the NHS. So we pray for the majority of people to continue acting responsibly and thinking of the safety of others. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. 
We now pray for all known to us in any kind of need. After each heading, I will pause, giving you time to think of someone. And so we pray for those recovering from operations. Those awaiting operations, but there will be no delay. We pray for those with long term illnesses. And finally, we pray for the lonely. Heavenly Father, pour your healing into these people's lives so that they may be whole again and know your peace and comfort, which comes through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. And we now pray, Father, for those grieving the loss of a loved one. In the silence of our hearts, we lift up their names to you. And particularly for the Polish family grieving the loss of husband and father of two young children. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Being made one in the power of the Spirit, we pray the prayer which Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Loving God, we thank you for hearing our prayers, for feeding us with your word, and encouraging us in our meeting together. Take us and use us to love and serve you and all people in the power of the Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you for joining with me this morning and God willing, we can meet again tomorrow at 10 o'clock. So filled with the Spirit's power, let us go into this day in the light and the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God.